everybody. Good to be with you. I'm AJ. I get to serve as one of the pastors here, and it is the greatest, the, se- the greatest season of all is upon us. Anybody know what I'm talking about when I say that? It's the most wonderful time of the year. Yeah, it's not. That's exactly right. Okay. Uh, this morning on my memories, I w- uh, something popped up, and I wanted to show you a picture. This is a very significant a reminder for me uh, because as, as I'm hearing updates on what God is doing among our neighbors and all across the nations, this popped up and I was reminded of, of a great work that God had, um, had been doing through many of us at Martinsburg Little League. Uh, you know that I'm deranged enough to serve on the board there, um, was able to convince Jamie to join me, Larry is also on that. There's several of us that have an involvement there. And in 2000, in whenever 6 minus 2024 is, not a math guy, Vera began T-ball, and I managed. And uh, it was like herding cats. But the guy that helped herd cats with me, his name is Mike. And God placed that man on my heart early on, and I began praying for him every single day. I would share uh, his name in my community group, and we would pray for him every Tuesday night. This morning, the elders met this morning to discuss this man, this brother, uh, because it was about a year ago where he came to faith in Jesus Christ. And uh, praise God indeed. So I was reminded of that this morning. I wanted to share that story with you because in my role, I have the great privilege of hearing stories of transformation all the time. And I want to share that with you more consistently. I had a great, we had great response and feedback from the story that we shared last week about Jillian and Mike and Brooke. And as often as I have stories of redemption, I want to begin sharing that with you more, more specifically. And so it was through a Titus 10 group that a year ago, this brother uh, experienced genuine, authentic conversation and community among a gr- group of men in ways that he's never experienced before. And I just want to encourage you, wherever you are, whether it's a, a baseball field, a soccer field, a chess match, at work, in the neighborhood, whatever. It's a mission field before it's a baseball field. And will you commit that to the Lord prayerfully and just stay faithful? Here we are all of these years later, and um, Lord willing, we'll put the elders will put him before you at the next members meeting as a member. And we'll see this brother baptized right here in May. And I just want to praise God for that publicly and share that story with you. As God allowed me to be reminded of that this morning, it's a great Ebenezer moment for me. Uh, We are in Genesis chapter 14 this morning, and we get to learn more about the God who saves. And uh, he does so amidst a a culture and a world that is full of danger and distraction. And so I went on a bit of a fishing expedition this week, as one man had put it, a fishing expedition for sermon illustrations. So I posted a, a question on social media, because you guys took the bait so well in the past, I thought, you know what, let's give it a shot again. And I asked the question, what is the greatest threat to a genuine Christ follower living in America today? It's a very specific question. I was intentional in how I crafted this. What do you think the answer is? As you kind of mull that over, what do you think the greatest threat to the genuine Christian Christ follower living in America today Now, there were a host of really interesting answers, as you can imagine. Some of you posted those interesting answers. Some of you laughed with me at those interesting answers. One that particularly resonated with me was just the simple answer, the man that I look at in the mirror every morning. I'm not sure how you might be inclined to answer that. But as we look at Genesis chapter 14, we may be surprised to realize that there are similar dangers and distractions today that there were thousands and thousands of years ago that we find in the narrative of the man by the name of Abram, one that we've been looking at now for a couple of weeks. We started in Genesis chapter 1, and by God's grace, marched through the first 11 chapters where we looked at what is considered the primeval history of humanity. Uh, 2,000 years are covered over the first 11 chapters. Who is man? Who is God? Why is life the way that it is? Why were we created? What was our purpose? Why are things as hard as they are? Is there hope? Or are we just kind of all out of luck at this point? We see life's biggest answers in Genesis chapter 1 through 3, and then it all kind of unfolds in in practical and and down-to-earth type ways to the rest of um, 4 through 11. And then as we turned into Genesis 12, 
it zoomed in from a bunch of generations over 2,000 years to now from 12 to 50, we're literally going to be looking at four generations. So we're zooming in now, more specifically, on the life and lineage of a man by the name of Abram, who will soon, we see in the text, be named Abraham. If we fall into the trap like so many people have, we think that this guy is one to be placed upon a pedestal because he is the patriarch of Christianity, of Judaism, of Islam. And we look at Abram, Abraham and we think that he must be this exemplary dude that has achieved all the things and we should act like him. Now he is a picture of faith. He's used in Hebrews chapter 11 as a man of, a man of faith. We found that early on in Genesis chapter 12. But then after walking and following God by faith, we realized that this famine had come in, in verse 10 of chapter 12, and suddenly his faith falls apart, and he walks by fear and not by faith. And we realize, though, that he's a man just like us. So our faith can't be placed in this guy. He, he's just, just like us. But I'm, I'm reminded that the Proverbs say in Proverbs 16 that the righteous fall seven times and rise again. So God, by his grace, restores Abram. We look at Genesis 13, and he rises from his fall, and he walks by faith again. That's what we looked at last week, where we saw this comparison between uh, Abram and his nephew Lot. You remember that there was a, a bit of a strife where Abram's camp had really grown to a massive size. Lot's had done similarly. Their herdsmen are out in the field together, and they realize I'm not going to try it. I butchered that statement last week about there's not enough room in this. Yeah, so they realize we got to go our own ways. It's really Abram's decision, but he gives it to Lot because Abram learned when I live by sight, it may make sense, but seeing is often more deceiving than believing. So Lot chooses to go in this place that appears as if the scriptures say it is the very garden of the Lord, referencing Eden in the early parts of Genesis. But Abram banks on the promises of God, and he follows after God. Lot doesn't do that. He temporarily sets up a tent in Sodom. And if you know anything about the Bible and places, you know that Sodom is a place of wickedness where men were wicked before the face of God. He just sets up a tent, kind of giving us this impression in the text that he doesn't plan to stay for very long. But the more that it unfolds, the more that we realize that he actually lays a foundation and sets up a camp. As I'd mentioned last week, it reminds me of the Psalm chapter 1 man who walks by the way of the wicked, and instead of keeping his eyes focused on what he should be focused on, he looks at the way of the wicked and he stops and stands. And long enough, he stands and sees that he thinks it's worth sitting in. Lot is found doing this. And through Lot, we realize that we are all kind of like him. We're naturally self-focused, and we aren't as wise as we think we are. He chose the land that looked like the Garden of the Lord. So he, he traveled east, which poetically in Genesis is a phrase that's associated with um, straying from the ways of God. Lot goes east as far as Sodom, and his folly is not immediately apparent. But in chapter 4, as we turn the page, we see it. So here we are in chapter 4. Um, God, once again, in this narrative, this story of real people, of real times, is overcoming the folly of men to accomplish his own purposes. And if Lot had not separated from Abram out of greed, chapter 14 doesn't exist. But he did. So it does. And we look at it this morning. And uh, so if you have a Bible with you, I would invite you to turn to Genesis chapter 14. If you don't have a Bible... Uh, we have free Bibles along the back wall for you, uh, both in Spanish and in English. So if, if there's anybody that would like a Bible that doesn't have one, will you raise your hand and someone will grab one for you? Anybody? Okay. All right, so we got three. Larry's got you. Anybody on this side that would like a Bible? Okay. All right, well, we're going to wait for Larry to get the Bible and return it, and then we'll read it together. So in the meantime, go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 14. And stand with me once you've got it in order to honor the reading of God's word. We'll be reading it in its entirety. Genesis chapter 14. Now, just as a disclaimer, people, I've practiced these names and my memory has failed me. So, I appreciate that. All right. This is the word of the Lord for us in Genesis chapter 14. 
In the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elisar, this is the tough one. Hmm. Kedalermar, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goim. These kings made war with Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, Shemaber, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. And all these joined forces in the valley of Siddim, that is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they had served Kedalamar, but in the thirteenth year they rebelled. And in the fourteenth year, Kedalamar and the kings who were with him came and defeated the Rephaim in the Ashtaroth Karnaim, uh, the Zuzim in, in Ham, the Enim in Sheva Kiriathim, and the Horites in the hill country of Seir as far as El Paran on the border of the wilderness. They turned their back and came to En Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and defeated all the country of the Amalekites. And also the Amorites who were dwelling in Hazazon Tamar. So there's a lot of stuff going on here. There's kings battling kings and from distant lands and unique names. Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Admah, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, went out and they joined battle in the valley of Siddim with Kedel... Oh, goodness gracious. Lord, help me. Um, Kedeleomar, king of Elam, title king of Goim, and... Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Elazar, four kings against five. Now, the valley of Siddim was full of bitumen pits, and at the kings, as the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell into them, and the rest fled to the hill country. So the enemy took all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah and all the provisions, and they went away. Look at verse 12. They also took who? Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom, and his possessions, and went their way. Then one who had escaped, so there's this war going on. Everybody's been taken and cap, taken captive, but there's one who escapes and runs to Abram the Hebrew, who was living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, the brother of Eshcol and of Ener. And these were allies of Abram. When Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. And he divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and pursued them to Hobah, north of Damascus. Then he brought back all the possessions and also brought back his kinsmen Lot with his possessions and the women and the people. And after his return from the defeat of Kerdeleomar and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheba, that is, the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said... Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord, God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing but that which the young men, young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. Let Anner and Eshkol and Mamre take their share. God, this is your word. Speak to us. Your people are listening. God's people said. You can be seated. So the big question that I see rising from this text is the same question that would be evident among the original audience those that are receiving this story after they've been ransomed from the slavery of Egypt and now being promised this land that is yet theirs. They're already in this already, but not yet. That's the original audience. There's a question for them. It's the same question for us today. What does it mean to be in the world, but not of the world? Or put another way, how must we live in a day of danger and distraction? Let me set the scene again because my reading of this probably confused you more than anything. There are powerful eastern kings from the land of Mesopotamia. So that's east of where these people are in Canaan. They, and these powerful people have swept through the land. They've destroyed and they plundered the cities. And they took Lot captive. So Abram responds because that's his kinsman. In verses 1 through 12, it explains that the kings of the Jordan served this man by the name of um, see something, Kaledermer, for 12 years. Which means that these kings, these nations were sending tribute. They were sending money to this guy and produce. They're doing that for 12 years. But in the 13th year, they rebel. They're tired of it. For whatever reason, we ain't giving you no more money, no more produce. It's ours. Year 14 comes. The king is coming with his allies to punish those who didn't pay up. 
Or it just so happens that because Lot made that decision a while ago to separate from Abram and go to what appeared to be the, the garden of the Lord, that he is now caught up in this battle and he's taken away. Seeing was believing at a time, but now he knew it was nothing but deceiving. Verses 13 to 24 is going to be the focus of what I'm going to share with you. And I want to summarize it this way with a big idea. It's difficult to exegete a text or to pull the meaning from the text while honoring the original audience's uh, understanding of it while also recognizing how the Spirit allows believers to apply it today. And the way we come to that conclusion is by thinking about what is called the authorial intent. As God had spoken to his people through Moses, what was he intending to communicate? And we know the word is timely for them. It's timeless, thereby making it by the Spirit of God also timely for us. And so we see from this text that by faith, God's people are saved and secured from the dangers and distractions of the world. Amen? Amen? Let me make this point as we look at this text together. From Abram's life, we learn really how to live in, in the day of danger and distraction. There's three points that I just kind of want to share from the text. And really, as I share these with you, uh, these aren't inspired. These are my way to try to summarize what's happening throughout this narrative. I kind of view them as mile markers, right? When you guys are driving from one place to another, you're 50 miles from Martinsburg. It helps when you're reminded, hey, we're 50 miles. We're 30 miles. Hey, we're 10 miles. That's what I hope these points are doing for us on a regular basis. Just to track with the text. This is how we live according to this passage. This is how we, followers of Jesus, those who, are, who have turned from sin, placed faith in Jesus, have been indwelled with the Holy Spirit. How do we live with hope on the horizon in a day of danger and distraction? First, we understand we live with, with courage in the face of threat. We live confident through the God of the promise and cautious with the goods of the world. Look at Genesis chapter 14, starting in verse 13. It says, then one who had escaped. Remember, there's this war. One guy breaks away from camp. He makes it. He finds Abram, the Hebrew, who's living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and of Aner, and these are the allies of Abram. Abram heard the report that his kinsmen, that his lot, had been taken captive. So he had taken his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, these are the Navy SEALs of his day, and they went in to pursue as far as Dan. He gets there, and he divides his forces among, against them by night, he and his servants, and he defeated them and pursued them to Hobah, north of Damascus. And then after he wins the battle against all of these kings, he brought back all the possessions. He also brought back his kinsmen a lot with his possessions and the women and the people. Abram hears of God's people being attacked. He jumps into action. And he demonstrates for those original audience, but also for us today, how to live in the midst of danger and distraction. First, we realize we have to be, as followers of Jesus, courageous in the face of threat. Our reaction to hard situations are not irrational when we have a high and proper view of God. When, when Abram... There was a famine in the land in Genesis chapter 10, chapter 12, verse 10. He had a poor view of God. He had forgotten the promise, and he makes some irrational decisions. We're not finding him doing this here. This is the difference between a controlled and a chaotic response. When hard things hit in life, which it will, it has, and it's going to. When we have a high view of God and we're walking with him by faith, we will have courage in the face of threat. There's a report. A lot has been taken. There are several armies, armies that have amassed. And as I'm reading this, I'm thinking, this is more terrifying than the famine that Abram crippled under. So it's not so much about the threat that we face. It's about the God that we are worshiping. And we're walking with him by faith. Major threats aren't major threats. But when we're not walking with him by faith, small threats seem like a game changer, the end of the world. I'm thinking this is more daunting than the famine, but he responds in faith. He banks on the blessing. Look at Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. Just turn back there for a, a quick second. At the first portion of it, God says to Abram, I will bless those who bless you. Lot had been a blessing to Abram. God, God's blessing then would extend to Lot as well. And this blessing, including divine defense... Chapter 12, verse 3 goes on. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram banks on the blessing. And he takes 318 of his Navy SEALs, his trained warriors, and he heads toward the fight. Not thinking that we have the strength to figure this out. 
but I know that God has told me to walk by faith. I'm going to do it. They come with a sneak attack under darkness. God blesses that effort. And Abram, by God's blessing, ransoms all the people in their possessions. It has me wondering, like, what does the family back home say? What about Sarai? What about the others? Maybe, maybe they're saying things like, and I don't know this, Lot has made his bed, let him lie in it. Maybe they're all about it. Maybe not. We don't know, but this is what we do know. They were facing an impossible threat. But Abram courageously faced it in faith. Now, this is when I, what I want to pause and just recognize, the challenge of, of teaching a text like this. Because if we're not careful, followers of Jesus today read this and apply it as if this means that the battle we face today is a physical war. Beloved, that's just not the case. We know this from the New Testament, that the God of this world is waging a losing war against the kingdom of God. The question that I have to ask myself is, will we face this threat with courage? Recognizing that the battle we fight is not a physical one, but a spiritual one. Turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, that's the New Testament towards the, towards the back of of your Bible. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. If you got it, say, I got it. Paul, the apostle, one who used to be killing Christians, is now being killed soon for Christ. He's writing to a church in Ephesus reminding them of the same realities that I am hoping that the Spirit presses upon us today, that he says, finally, Ephesians 6, verse 10, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. But we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against the rulers, the authorities, the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We don't fight a physical war. Rather, the, the war that we are a part of, if we're a follower of Jesus, is a spiritual battle. Write this reference down. It's 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. It says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. We fight a spiritual war. And if we live blind to that, then we're going to chalk a lot of things up to hardship, coincidences, uncertainties, unknowns. I love how John G. Payton had put this in his autobiography, a missionary sent to the New Hebrides, which is a, an island of cannibals, many, 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 many years ago. I've referenced this book lots, and if you've not read it, I would really encourage you to pick it up. Before he goes to the field, this missionary field, where there are literally cannibals there that want to kill him, I, I want to share this with you in light of this reality that it's not so much physical battle but a spiritual one he says among many who sought to deter me was one dear old christian gentleman who whose crowning argument was always the cannibals you will be eaten by the cannibals if i heard that i'm not so sure that i'm gonna go at last he says i replied mr dixon you are advanced in years now and you own pros- your own prospect is soon to be laid in the grave there to be eaten by worms i confess to you that if I can but live and die serving and honoring the Lord Jesus, it will make no difference to me whether I am eaten by cannibals or by worms. This is what it looks like to live courageously in the face of threat. Several of us, maybe 30 guys this week, last week wrapped up our Titus 10 group. There were three different groups of 10 men. Uh, my crew got together for breakfast this week. This is what we look like. It's a good time. I thank God for those men and what he's doing in all of our lives. And, and one of the chapters that we got through caused us to think deeply about spiritual warfare. It's kind of the phrase that we refer to this reality, that our battle is not a, a physical one but a spiritual one. And the author, J. Josh Smith, he, he mentions this point. He says, if you believe what Jesus says about the devil, then you know the enemy wants to destroy everything and everyone in your life. If you believe what Jesus says about your union with him, Christian, then you know that you have a right and responsibility to take a stand against the devil. So my question is, when is the last time that you think genuinely Satan tried to hurt you, your family, or your church? And when was the last time that you engaged in spiritual warfare? 
The reality is that all of us have and do on a regular basis. We're most likely just blind to it. As we think about this text and the, the, the threat that we face, let's be honest, we live in a day and age in our country right now where the threat against Christians is by and large not a physical one. Maybe that will change one day. That's, who knows? But we do know that we have an adversary, the devil, who prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And I can promise you that he's not going to come in here with four paws in a mane roaring. He's going to get after your relationships. He's going to get after your affections. He's going to tempt you to sin. He's going to promise you things that he'll never guarantee and never, never come through on. How often do we realize these things are happening in our home, in my own heart, in our church family? See, the life of every follower of Jesus is full of danger and distraction. And the response of our hands, it reveals the conditions of our heart. This was true of Abram. It was true of ancient Israel. It's true of us. Sure, we are to live courageously in the face of threat, but how? Genesis 14, 17. Look at it with me. After Abram returns from the de defeat of um, Keterlandomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheba, that is, the king's valley. Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He's a priest of God Most High. And he blessed Abram, and he said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. What is going on? Who is this dude that just busted out of nowhere and looks like they're having some kind of church service out in the wilderness? You got bread and wine, you got some sort of prophet, you got blessing, you got people giving things. Like, it's what's going on? The point that, that we can find to be evident for the believers then, those that follow God in faith, and those who are with Christ today, faithfulness in a, danger, in, a, in a season of danger and distraction has really one foundation. It is living confident through the God of the promise. This is not self-confidence. Uh, there's a, a, a brother, a part of this church body, who told me that for the longest time, he viewed Christians as though they're just weak. And to that I said, you are right all along. Ain't none of us strong in our own selves. And when we live as if we think that's true, then we will prove the point very quickly that we are, in fact, on our own, very weak. Our confidence should never come from anything of us. It always comes from him, the one who saved our soul. Abram was sent, he was saved, and he was sustained by God. And he knew this, and he lived accordingly in the face of danger. And after he comes back, with all of the possessions, all the kinsmen, he's met by two kings. And, and these two kings are both literal, real figures, but also metaphorical for us in the sense that it should cause us to realize that there are two ways to live in a life that is filled by danger and distraction. We have this, this old boy come out by the name of Bera. And you, if you're ever wondering what our boy's namesake is, that ain't it, I promise you. Um, and then uh, you have... This other fellow that comes out by the name of Melchizedek. Both of them approach Abram, both of them making uh, offers, and Abram responding to both of them. And in so doing, we find this, this picture that there really are two ways to live. We are all faced with danger and distraction. And there's two ways to respond to them. Abram's life gives us a picture that I want to pause over this character, Melchizedek, for a moment. So please track with me because it seems a bit odd, but it is absolutely beautiful what we find here. Melchizedek, uh, as, as our sister Martha was praying, I was thinking, um, and Melchizedek for some reason had come into my mind, and, and I thought, he's almost like a John the Baptist of the Old Testament. He comes out of nowhere, seemingly. He comes with blessing from God, but he doesn't point to himself. Just kind of an interesting note. He seems... Not seems, it is clear that he is a genuine brother of the faith. Now, lest we think Abram is the only follower of God by faith at this point, Melchizedek comes along and wrecks our understanding of that. Where he came from, we don't know. But he declares God most high. When Abram hears that, he, he recognizes that he has a spiritual kinsman here. One who is recognizing that they are under the, the divine rule of the spirit creator God, Melchizedek. Melchizedek comes with this blessing. He is, a, he is for sure a Christ-type figure. He has this very interesting role. If you know much about the Bible, then maybe it stands out to you, but if not, that's okay too. We're going to work through it together. He's, he is re referred to as a priest king. A priest king. Now, there are none other 
after this man that would serve as a priest king, God would make a distinction. He would separate these two roles of a priest and a king. We'll look at this later on. Um, Abraham would have Isaac. Isaac would have Jacob. Jacob has a bunch of kids, 12 sons. All of them are named. They become the 12 uh, tribes of Israel. One of those sons is Levi, and from Levi would come the Levites, the Levitical priesthood, and only those that were of the descendants of Levi could become priests. But Melchizedek comes onto the scene before all of this takes place. He's a priest king. It's fascinating that God would separate this, but before he does, he allows one to come onto the scene. And when people get this twisted, bad things happen. In Isaiah chapter 6, there's this man mentioned. His name is King Uzziah. And uh, Isaiah chapter 6 says, In the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah sees a, a vision of the throne room. King Uzziah began to reign over Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel, at a very young age in his teenage years, and he would reign for decades. And under his leadership, Judah would, would prosper materially, economically. The military would be strong. Like, they were locked down, solid. But there came a time at the end of his life where Uzziah thought that he could be more than what God made him to be as a king. He would go to the temple, and he would offer sacrifice as if he was a priest, and God would strike him dead with leprosy. There is a distinction in the scriptures between a priest and a king. But then we read in Psalm chapter 110 that there seems to be one that would be coming just like Melchizedek. Turn to Psalm 110, if you will. Psalm 110, it's in the middle of your Bible. This is the ancient prayer and hymn book of ancient Israel. Psalm 110. Psalm 110, verse 1, if you got it, say, I got it. It wasn't loud enough, I'll give you another second. It's quite all right. The Lord says to my Lord, verse 1, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. I'm just, I'm not going to, there's no, no surprise here. This is a, a prophetic psalm about the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. That happens in the book of Revelation, if you're wondering. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of power in your holy garments from the womb of the morning. The dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. Speaking of the coming Messiah, you are a priest forever after the order of who? Melchizedek. My, oh my. Now turn towards the end of your Bible to Hebrews chapter 7. I told you we're going to get in the weeds a little bit. I consider not doing this. And then I thought, who am I to withhold such beautiful truth from the people of God? Hebrews chapter 7. Turn there, if you will. That's towards the end of your Bible. Sometimes it's a little tricky for me to find, so I'll give you some time. Hebrews chapter 7. I love the sound of pages turning. There are people in the world that don't have access to the Scriptures. That ain't us. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 14. It says, For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him. Who do you think him is here? It's Jesus. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus would be the one who would follow in the footsteps of this man, Melchizedek, to become both priest, one who would make atonement and sacrifices on the behalf of sinners to be made right with God, but also king, who would rule and reign over all of their life. And we find that evident in the call for all sinners of all people and all places to turn to Jesus in faith. Let me just go to one last passage. If you're new here, we don't always bounce around this much. But in order to understand Melchizedek, we have to let the Scriptures interpret itself. So go to Romans chapter 10, if you will. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. We find this man coming along, Genesis 14. 
Melchizedek, he's a priest king. These things don't happen anymore. God has separated the two. But then Psalm 110 speaks of one to come in the future who would become the one in the line in the order of Melchizedek, both priest, king. And then the book of Hebrews leaves no room for us to wonder who that is. It says it's Jesus. And Paul in the book of Romans gives us very practical implication of what that means for every single one of us. We're not just like pie in the sky here. This matters for life transformation. And he says, Romans chapter 10, verse 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is what? That, my friends, is kingly rule. It means that you look at Jesus by faith, recognizing that he lived perfectly on your behalf, died in your place, and rose from the dead. That if you look at him and you say, there's not one score inch of my life, my soul, where I am not declaring you Lord. He is king of my life. Whoever confesses with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be what? Saved. So when Jesus comes, he offers his life as a sacrifice. He does the work of a priest. The only difference is he doesn't offer the blood of the ram and the, bo- the, the, the goat and the bull. He offers himself the spotless blemishless lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and he doesn't just um, uh, facilitate the sacrifice by offering something he gives himself and when he rises from the dead he completes once and for all the finished work of a priest and now whoever confesses with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believes in their heart that God really raised him from the dead then they'll be saved this is the good news of the gospel right here in Genesis chapter 14 We just got to do a little bit of digging to get there. Now let me pull back, back to where we were. Genesis 14, two ways to live. These two guys come up. Bera, the king of Sodom. Then this fellow by the name of Melchizedek. He's like the king of Salem. Most people believe that's like ancient Jerusalem. He's a brother. He's also in a position of spiritual authority and somehow over Abram. That's evident by the decision that he makes. But is he going to show deference to King Bera? Deference meaning like submission, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bow myself to you and the, and the things that you want. Is he going to do that to King Bera, who is representing the world? Or is he going to show deference? Is he going to bow himself to priest King Melchizedek, who is coming representing God most high? And Abram, he is blessed. Verse 14, verse 20, Abram gives to Melchizedek a tenth of everything. He's blessed, and he gives away what he got from the battle. He doesn't need to hoard because he is confident through the God of the promise. Whereas he went into the famine before thinking he needed to secure himself, he realizes here, I've got all this stuff, I don't need any of it. I have God. That's all I need. This is an upside-down response in our minds because a lot, a lot of times in our culture, in our minds, we're thinking, if I'm blessed by God, it means that I'm gaining materially. Friends, that is a lie. Blessing here is gaining by losing. In fact, siding with the enemy, according to this text, sometimes looks like material gain. It's upside down. Look at Genesis 14, 21 to 24. Turn back there if you need to. Genesis 14, 21 to 24. So here we are. There, after the battle, these two kings come to him. You have Bera here. You have Melchizedek here. Abram has a response to make. So Melchizedek comes. He blesses Abram. And now Sodom, king of Sodom, he's going he's gonna to shoot his shot. And he says to, to Abram, just give me the person's. And take the goods for yourself. But Abram says to the king of Sodom, now this is a faith-filled response. I have lifted my hand to the Lord, God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you say, I have made Abram rich. Do you remember one of the markers of the fruit of faith from a couple of weeks ago? There's only one name proclaimed. It's not Abram. It's not Berah. It is God most high. I'm not taking anything from you, King Bera, lest you say that it's about you. Take it all so that he gets the glory. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. Let Aner, Eshkol, and Memory take their share. How ought the people of God live in a world of danger and distraction? Courageous in the face of threat, confident through the God of the promise, and cautious with the goods of the world. Cautious with the goods of the world. There were two believers that went to Harvard Business School, came out, made a bunch of money, were crushing it. According to how many of us look at success in the world, would have said, 
you are as successful as it gets. But as they follow Jesus, they had to know for themselves, what does the Bible actually say about the goods of the world? What does it say about possessions and, and money? And so thus they did a study of the scriptures and they wrote a book, which has been very helpful for me and so many others. And they, they survey the Bible on possessions and money and they come away asking this new type of question. They no longer ask of themselves, how much should I give to the kingdom? Instead, they are now asking, how much should I keep for myself? There's this flipped mentality to say, instead of just hoarding and just giving a portion, I'm going to keep just a small portion and, and just give it away. That's the, that's the Bible's picture of how we ought to see the goods of the world. We know that the goods of the world from the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3, they may be a delight to the eyes, they may appeal to us. Eve thought that if she partook of it, it would make one wise. But, but God said to her, lest you take and eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. She believed a lie that if she could get her hands on the goods of the world, she was deceived. We can be deceived. Lot was deceived. I just want to pause and be careful here. This is not to say that the Bible is saying the goods of the world are evil. That's not the case at all. In fact, we ought to look at the goods of the world, whatever it is, as fire. Fire is a neutral thing. It could be used for lots of good. You cook with it. You warm the house. You do all kinds of good things. But if in the wrong hands, with the wrong motive, you're going to burn the house down. If we're not cautious with the goods of the world, beloved, as Abram is found here with Bera's offer, we're going to burn the house down. We better live cautiously with the goods of the world. Verse 16, Abram came back with all the possessions, all of them. In ancient times, whenever you would conquer a people in a place, you wouldn't just uh, set up flag and say like, hey, we did it. You're taking it all back with you. And he came back with all the possessions. Verse 21, and Barah says to him, like, you take the people, or you take the goods. I just want the people for myself. You take the goods. In verse 24, Abram, he says, I'm taking nothing, nothing from you. Why? He's living by faith, and he knows that any gain received from God will reflect God's grace. He was deceived by sight not long ago. I got him in trouble with Pharaoh. He wouldn't do it again. So here we find this mirror moment for us. We look at the text, we understand the world through the teaching of the scriptures. But it's not just a window, it's also a mirror. We hold the text up prayerfully, asking the Spirit of God, Psalm 139, search my heart and try my thoughts. See if there's any grievous way in me. We hold this text up before us as if it is a mirror and we genuinely ask him to search us. And I wanna just, this is how we're gonna finish. I want you to just stare in the mirror and ask, where am I failing to guard myself from the dangers and distractions of this world? What goods have I given myself to? So pause and pray. Ask the Spirit of God to search you. And I'll close us in prayer here in a moment. For those of us with the Spirit of God within us, we would only have needed probably a second to know exactly where we have gone astray if we have. Uh, thank you for your mercy and your grace that by your kindness you lead your people to repentance. By your kindness you don't smash us with guilt or with shame. In fact, you promise the opposite, that you don't deal with us according to our iniquities. You remove them as far from us as the east is from the west but you are not prepared, interested, content, leaving us where you have found us. And so I pray for those in this room that are followers of Christ, that these questions you would use to poke and prod, to transform us, and to make us more like Jesus. I pray that our grip on the goods of this world would loosen as our grips upon the kingdom of God would tighten. 
So use us however you see fit and, and instill within us a true belief and desire uh, to walk with you with all that we have. So I thank you, Lord, for your word, for how an ancient, literal, historical story of Abram would still be so applicable for us today that you, by faith, Lord, you, you have saved us, you secure us, you've guarded us, you are keeping us until that final day when we will stand before you, Lord. We long for that day. But until then, Lord, have your way among us. Those that are far from you today, Lord, I pray that you would prick their hearts and their consciences, their minds would be stirred to think differently about life and their purpose, that you would give us opportunities to just get to know them, and hear their story, and have conversations. We pray, Lord, that you would have your way and to add to your fold for your glory and our great joy. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The band's going to come, and we're going to sing. And as they come, I just want to quote Randy Alcorn in light of this final thought with rejecting King Barah's offer. Randy Alcorn says that God sees our faith and our finances as inseparable. And generally when we think about the goods of the world, maybe that's what comes to mind. And so I want to lean in and just say, be on guard and recognize that danger and distractions abound. Are you on guard? Christian, live with this reality that he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So stand and let's sing of those realities together.